Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. It's your time in the Becoming the Best You Conference in St. Louis is where you want to be. This three-day event featuring over 35 impactful speakers with 16 breakout sessions to choose from will help you achieve the best of your life for the rest of your life. Come and dance the night away on Saturday night at the Black Tie Affair and enjoy the live entertainment as we close out tickling your funny bone with comedian Jeremy Nunez. Get your tickets today and we'll see you there. This world is changing more and more every day, and we've decided to change right along with it. My name is Dr. Lauren Michaels Harris, and I'm the president of Trajectory TV Network. At Trajectory, our vision is to provide a comfortable, a creative platform for top content creators and storytellers from around the globe. We're also dedicated to providing this world with content that is healing, educational, empowering, exciting, and above all else, entertaining and transparent. So right now, I invite all of you who believe yourselves to be global game changers to use the link found here and simply take a chance. Schedule a virtual chat where you'll have the opportunity to share your vision for your very own global television show with me, the network president. So use that link and together, let's begin changing and healing this world one story at a time. And remember, whether you have years of experience in front of the camera or zero experience, it doesn't matter. What matters the most is your desire to share great content through television and a willingness to share it with passion and with purpose. You might ask, how do I know if I've fallen in love with my purpose and my purpose has fallen in love with me? It's easy when you've lost your voice because you just can't stop talking about it. I'll see you soon. You can. You can navigate the legal and emotional journey of divorce and exit a marriage the way you entered it with mindfulness, love, and respect. Solace Divorce Mediation is a full-service law practice helping couples focus on the health and well-being of children and their forever co-parenting family. Our streamlined divorce journey offers flat fees with an estimated completion time frame of two to four months. If you or a friend need us, visit solacedivorce.com. Nina, spell it off 
before you get it, baby Show me your soul And honey, I'll show you I'll show you mine You doggone Skippy, wake that ass up. Don't, ain't no sleeping up in here. Ain't even, you can't even nod. I'm just like, remember that? Yeah, I'm not kidding you. My mom used to nod off in church all the time and swear up and down. I wouldn't sleep. Yep. I guess that drool and that snoring was which because you were awake. So anyway, there's none of that up in here today because we are in the midst of the awakening. Every moment we are above ground, we have an obligation to open our spiritual eyes wider and wider and wider. Can I get an amen? Welcome, everybody, to today's installment. Give yourselves a round of applause to uh, Bathroom Moments. I'm your host, Lauren Michael Sarris, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Uh, first and foremost, I'm excited because it gives all of us, each of us, that opportunity to just get right inside one of the greatest promises available through the creator and that is the one that guarantees us where two or more of us comes together and we've got that mindset of togetherness that collective agreement if you will that a say that amen yes you know what i'm talking about that mindset of oneness so when we come together uh spiritual magic is what happens and so we're here today to grow and to sow all right to grow together and to sow into each other again can i get an amen that means that we are in agreement. Where is it? I got to pop it up on the screen. I sure do. Uh, I know it's in here somewhere. I moved stuff around. I had all these. Did you guys see? I had a last couple of weekends, um, two weekends in a row, 90 minute television specials and uh, a lot of fun. There we go. Can I get an amen up in here? There you go. So listen, a couple announcements before we get going. We got a great show for you today, as always. A um, couple announcements. There you go. Up on the screen, the Legacy of Hope Tour. Uh, we are headed, in fact, we signed with our Yellow Jackets uh, travel agency out of Kentucky this week. And they are taking care of all of our lodging, our airfare and everything. As 20 of us head over to the country of Romania. We leave on May 4th and we come back on the 12th. So we ask you for traveling mercy. Send us your light, your love and your support. As we go over, there's the other poster to impart some some hope, some love, and some joy uh, to the people of Romania, in particular, all of those young people over there dealing with so much. Also, not this weekend, but the weekend following, I will be in uh, Miami, Florida, with some of my homies and all, just about all of my um, immediate coaching uh, crew. The LMH Rockstars. We're heading down there for a mastermind entitled Awaken the Abundant Master Within, and we have room for you. You can either join us uh, virtually, pay-per-view, $40 for the entire experience, or if you want to come in person, the tickets are $100. You'll find both of those opportunities on Eventbrite under Awaken the Abundant Master Within Miami, Florida. And also, prayers again in Traveling Mercies for all of the wonderful uh, influencers and speakers and um, attendees headed down to St. Louis this weekend for the Becoming the Best You uh, conference. So excited. Brenda Ringwood, Terrence Leftridge, a lot of other great illuminaries are going to be there. I will be there. Tracy Randolph will be there. Prince Michael will be there. Dr. Lotus Roche will be there. And the list goes on and on. You saw the commercial. We'll play it again before the end of the broadcast, but we'd love to have you there too. So uh, Las Vegas, there it is. So uh, yeah. One more time up on the screen, the business mindset, mastery, master, uh, master everything. I'm not kidding you. We're going to have a great time. We're going to master more than just our minds, awaken the abundant master within. So, um, who's here today? She's been here. It was, it's been a minute. Um, Alicia, Alicia Roberts Novak. Now she reached out about coming on the show and I was like, 
Okay. So what you got? And how perfect is the timing? Um, Black History Month, you know, and we're going to start with a little something I want you to see uh, as we kind of warm up the stage, if you will, for what we're going to see and experience today through Alicia. So I want to take you guys into a little, you know, I've been doing these um, Black History moments, okay? So today I wanted to share something with you about Black History Month again. So take a look, here we go. Black History Month is an annual celebration of achievements by African-Americans and a time for recognizing their central role in U.S. history. During his time as president, Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month by calling upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. February was chosen for a number of reasons including the births of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln and the founding of the NAACP, to name a few. Each year, we honor Black Americans and all those who continue the fight against systemic racism and who advocate for total equality. This year's Black History Month theme, Black Resistance, explores how African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression since the nation's earliest days. When reflecting on this year's theme, we think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, and countless others for their courage in standing up for basic human, civil, and equal rights. We also think of the work being done through the Black Lives Matter movement and that of many others in our local communities who carry on their legacies. We celebrate these legacies, new and old, and support their activism. Littler remains focused on being stronger allies to the Black community, which continues to experience marginalization, racism, and oppression. We are committed to standing in solidarity as we continue to work together to achieve equality for all. We take this moment to honor Littler's Black employees and allies. Today, as every day, we recognize them and their contributions to advancing inclusion, equity, and diversity at the firm in the legal industry and across our communities. Mm. Wow, and then they had the Tyrese Nichols thing up there at the last minute. Um, thank you, Littler. I found that and I thought that that was great. I don't know them from Adam, but you know what? They took the time to celebrate and that's what we need to do more of with each other and for each other not just settle for all those times that we're merely in those places where we're tolerated, trying to find your way into the arms of purpose where you can consistently be celebrated. Can I get an amen? I thought so. So, okay, let's get her in here. Uh, get some hearts on the screen, you guys. It's our way of virtually applauding as we bring in. She's going to bring something to us today uh, entitled The Gen X Project. It's a museum piece, and we're going to learn more about that and why it came about and why they felt it is so important. So, welcome, Alicia Roberts Novak. <laughs> morning uh -oh. good morning are you on your phone i was just making sure all my notes was here you know i haven't been here for a while and i love your show and i'm excited to be here it's black history month and guess what we black and black and then black and black what our month say what in the world what did you just say black and black and black and black yeah, it comes from a Juneteenth t-shirt where it says Black History Month is every month every month. And so I'm blackity, 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 blackity. Oh, okay. See, I don't get out much. So there it is. So oh yeah, absolutely. Um start well, say hello. I'm gonna give you a chance to just uh kind of tell people a little bit more about you than other just than just other the Gen Project um uh, museum piece, but just about you. So I'm going to dip out for a minute, give you the stage, say hello to everybody, and I'll pop back in. We'll get started. Sound okay? Sure. All right. Well, um, good morning. My name is Alicia Roberts Snowback. And actually, I know Lauren from business. I'm the CEO of Administrative Resolutions Network. But I do a lot of work within our community here in Chicago, on the south and west side of Chicago, and particularly, I'm at home right now in my bathrobe for uh, Lauren. But um, 
in working with the community, I noticed that a lot of times, particularly in Chicago, everybody only hears about the crime. And Chicago is so much more than that. And particularly now in a time in which people don't have an opportunity to tell their stories, when I was uh, asked by the Illinois State Museum to tell my story, I said, I can't tell my story without telling everyone's story and giving people an opportunity to be part of a process and, and understand that being able to tell someone's story is so powerful for other, the person that is sharing, the person that are listening, and the person that are learning from someone else's experience. So that was one of the reasons why um, I kind of started this project. And it just happened to open right before Black History Month after uh, 13 months of work and working in the community and gathering stories. So I'm here today to talk about that. Okay, so it's featured. I, I I watched it, and it's so it's featured, or featuring rather a, a particular school in Chicago. Yes, Limbloom Technical High School is in um, West Inglewood neighborhood. Inglewood um, is a very old neighborhood, particularly. Um, it has been historically African American over the last 50 years. But prior to that, it was more Caucasian. And uh, then, of course, the diversity you know, started to happen. Um, and also, uh, you know, Inglewood is one of those areas in Chicago that is being regentrified. So it's very exciting that we have one of the top uh, schools that has, uh, we have to, you know, apply to get into the school, like Whitney Young, that on the north side. Um, it is a elective school that you, you have a selective school in which you have to test into. And it's one of the gems of the south side of Chicago. And um, when I looked at what school, you know, we should probably talk about, I thought Limblum would be a great idea. It's one of my alma maters. I actually graduated from Limblum in 1988. It still ranks extremely high. It's usually between one and three. Historically, I think it's like number eight in the, in the city right now, as far mm -hmm. as all of the uh, high schools and being a selective high school. And um, it's just a wonderful story of that particular school, which everyone knows has the most team spirit in the city. They actually run a trophy when the Mays Jackson show when he did uh, which high school has the most uh, team spirit. And it's been around. Uh, it was established in 1919 by mm. uh, Robert uh, Limblum, who was a trader at the Chicago Board of Trade and who believed that um, we basically needed to learn to work at a time where you had a lot of academics, but you didn't have a lot of people that were coming into the industrial um, industry industrial revolution um during that time period we needed more people that would understand like not just vocation and academic programs but to build a, a learning center that had diverse curriculum so like you know science uh social science languages technology and that's why Limblum has been successful from the day to the open over 100 years ago nice so um what do you think it is about that school that you know people do well they graduate they go on into life but i noticed that so many of the graduates stay or return to exactly. the area yeah it's it's funny because people will say and if you know anyone that's from Limblum, we have a lot of uh teams here we have a lot of camaraderie uh we have known each other for literally six 50 60 years and uh particularly from the baby boomers and the generation x uh community the millennials are slowly started to join the alumni association where they'll say they'll say you know what you guys are a cult like for real like people have friendships and people you know they they, they uh know each other or you have people who are like you know i was in high school i don't pay attention to people in high school i you know went on to college i'm more closer to my college friends right uh, we were just not uh, built that way. We weren't born that way. We are Limbloom Eagles and we swoop and we fly and we are always told that we are, you know, the number one leaders and that we were kind of like, you know, told basically when we walked in the first day and tested for the school and was accepted that it's your responsibility to make not only your future better, but to reach back and make the next generation future right. And so we took that as, you know, a, a call of action, not only to go in and get a good education and go on to higher learning, but that we had a responsibility to our families, to the students that were there 
and to our community as a whole. And so as a graduate, I mean, and this was the baby boomers that basically came up with these traditions. They would always come back and, and like share with us what went on, you know, in college, share with us what the clothes were, what the music were. They came back and they taught in the school. They volunteered. They raised funds. They had activities that they mm-hmm. did us. So because we were taught that way, right, and we were kind of built that way, those same traditions have been there for the last, like, basically the whole time of the school, but definitely within the last 70 years going forward. Um, well, people coming well, back and, you know, making sure we keep those traditions going. Well, it's a grooming process, <laughs> you know, and I find it really interesting because, and, you know, a lot of us, um, and I'm from Michigan, and so is my husband, um, actually, um went to Michigan State, he did, um, and what happened there just the other day, yeah. and it's happening 60-some shootings in the country, and we're not even two months into the year, right. but my point in bringing that up is, um, you know, I'd speak at a lot of schools, and some of the top schools in this area, and one thing I didn't see, because last year at the Power Wii, we had one of those top schools, which will remain nameless, because I don't want to think I'm calling them out, <laughs> But one of the things the students did have to say, even though we rank some of the highest in the state for certain things, we feel like, you know, sometimes at school, it just feels like it's all about the test scores. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that resonated when I was watching your, your documentary. And I thought, you know, that's the thing. A lot of kids leave these uh, impoverished areas or inner city areas. Um, and they go as far away as they can, never to return. But when there's this pride of ownership mm-hmm. uh, that comes with where you where you got what you have, um, oftentimes it will do exactly what um, Lindblom has done. So um, I want you. Uh, it's a. T- I think it's around ten minutes or so. The the video, right? Yes. Okay, and I wanted to. I didn't know. I went in looking to think about clips, but I couldn't stop watching. So I thought, well, let's just show them the whole piece today so why don't you set that up i love that yeah set up because there's a lot of gems in there and it's and i want people you guys remember this when you watch this isn't something just about a school this is something about an essence it is a spirit it is you know it's spiritual pixie dust if you will that can anoint um everything you're doing in this same mindset i i know can be lifted and laid like a template on top of your church uh, family, your exactly. your your biological family, your community family, um, any place where you find yourself um, around people that you love to be around. So um, we're going to take a look at it, but go ahead and set it up and tell us why you thought it was important not to just share your story, but the collective. There's a lot more power in collective, but oftentimes ego will lead us the opposite direction. So uh, how did you come to that decision? You know, it's funny that you brought up the religious aspect because everybody always asks me, like, you know, you worked on this project every day for 13 months, not just the actual museum exhibit and curating that for the stories, um, for the memorabilia, for the artifacts. I wanted to make sure that people had a platform to be seen in a time in which people are always trying to tell your story or tell you what you should think about yourself. I wanted to take different generations and people from different backgrounds that um, have been to the school, that have been out in business, that had traveled the world, and who could like really be able to kind of put together a, mo- a mosaic of the diaspora of the school and that they could speak from the heart. And so in doing Doing that, we set up the Generation X studio where we would get different people to come in and we would go to different events for people to be able to share their stories that would necessarily, you know, be seen, you know, going to people's houses and have people come into the studio. And this is a culmination that we thought would be great to kind of put, as well as for the documentary, into the um, museum exhibit at the museum to give it more interaction for the students, but also to kind of help them kind of paint the picture of what they were going to be walking through within Generation X exhibit as a whole. Now, for people that are watching locally or in the Chicagoland area, where exactly is the exhibit? The exhibit is at the Illinois State Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Okay, it's obviously in southern um, Southern Illinois. It's about a three-hour drive, the same amount of time to go from the north side to a south suburb in traffic. Right. And it's right up 55. But the museum itself is free to attend. Okay. It's ample parking. 
And uh, we had an opening on September 28th. We had about 100 people for the soft opening. Uh, we had people drove down and spent the night and enjoyed themselves. But um, the actual opening date for us is uh, March 10th. It's Limb Bloom Day. It's all day, half day for the students in the morning. And then we're having, I should say, the museum is having what they call their gala. It's called the Gen X Prom. It's kind of cute. It's black tie. It's March 10th at night with cocktails and drinks and entertainment. So we're looking very um, it, uh we're looking forward to March 10th because now you get to see the expanded version in every single one of the ga um, galleries, including the Generation of Excellent, which is our studio. Awesome. So will they be taking as like, I hate to say field trips, I don't like that, um, extended, an extended learning experience, if you will. Are they taking some of the students, I hope? Down. Yes, actually, that's part of the Gen X project in partnership with the Illinois State Museum. And it's actually the name of the school now is Limbloom Math and Science Academy. Fancy, fancy. Yes. That <laughs> that's why if it were me, I'd run in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> These kids are brilliant, literally. That's um, why I'm running the opposite actually, direction. I don't qualify. <laughs> we're actually hosting them that day for Limb Bloom Day. So we're having about 50 to 60 kids in their chaperones come down uh, during that day. It's a press day as well uh, for a, a um, program that starts at 10 o'clock that morning and goes to 3 o'clock that um, afternoon. And it's a learning experience. They're going to have a scavenger hunt that's going to be part of their homework assignment to bring back to the other students that weren't there. There'll be a performance by the students. There'll be speeches. And during that time, uh, over the fundraisers that the uh, our um, 501c3 that we're still setting up, genexq.org started last year in conjunction with the project. We had three uh, fundraisers in which we had uh, quite a few uh, dignitaries, I would say, and, and, and uh, alumni from Limbo, and particularly one of the comedians hosted a fundraiser. We, with all of the money that we raised last year, we will be presenting college scholarships through the uh, genexq.org uh, uh, to the students that will be graduating for 2023. And we're very proud of that as alumni and uh, the fact that we're not only able to give back uh, through being teachers, administration, mentors, but we're also able to uh, support and donate for the kids that are leaving to go to college that wouldn't other have, you know, they wouldn't have money to uh, be able you to, you know, sure. keep up with their fees. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to take a look, you guys, at the uh, documentary. So sit back, grab yourself your, your beverage of choice and great time to share this out while you're watching. Um, you won't be disappointed. Here we go. Court ordered desegregation was one of the most ambitious and controversial government policies for over the last 60 years. Beginning in 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education decision, the majority of the nation's large school districts were subject to mandatory desegregation plans. In some districts, long run integration was achieved. The number of new court order desegregation plans peaked in the early 1970s and declined steadily thereafter. Although the student body came from different neighborhoods, religions, social and economic backgrounds, and various races, we were all taught that we had a responsibility to achieve greatness and give back to our communities. Lim Bloom is a selective enrollment school always has been and that excellence that we attain is based on a fabulous curriculum that has always been part of our rich history everyone that attends them Bloom seems to have the same goal in mind they they apply themselves and every type of student is eligible for them Bloom. A lot of us commuted and we took um, two buses and two trains to get from one side of town. So so that itself took a lot. I, I can remember personally getting up around five ish and, you know, leaving out, you know, around six and to get to school on time for for courses. As a former student and as an educator, <laughs> I think the expectation of Limblum students is to excel. One of our models has always been our history guides our future. 
and where excellence prevails. And so that has never been more present in looking at our current students and our past students. The Limbalom tradition was written and recited by each student to take an oath that we, the student body of Limbalom High School, shall continue to meet the standards set for us by our ever-changing world, that the dreamers shall dream on for they are the mainstay of our world and dreamers become the thinkers, that the thinkers keep an open mind for we accept new ideas and the thinkers become doers, that the doers shall achieve success in their plans and their dreams for the full potential of everyone must be realized if our nation will continue to be great, that among the group is the individual for each person is different and every person must set their own goals and the individual becomes the leader, that the traditions are followed even though many new ideas shape the mind of the student and traditions ever respected, that we always look to the future. Students came back with their um, gear, their college gear on. They came back from whatever school they went to and it was something that we all wanted to do. And that's something that I can really remember was that the school raised the bar and the students that walked those halls and left came back and raised the bar for other generations. When I was a student, the last thing on my mind was that I was gonna walk through those doors at any given point, you know, much less as a counselor and then an administrator. But I knew in my heart that what had been instilled in me as a student was something I definitely wanted to always come back and give back and raise up another generation. Our teachers, they were former students that taught us sportsmanship and our ability to form lasting bonds. My eighth grade teacher, Miss Miss O'Leary, she uh, uh, was the one who, who uh, saw potential in me because I didn't see the potential in myself at the time, but she saw potential in me and she said, uh, you know, you, you, you should apply for a flight to go to Limbalo. And I looked around and I was in, in a whole new neighborhood, had, had started getting new friends and started having a different outlook on what I want to do in life. And I was like, wow because Limbalone just opened my eyes to it as far as the, the teachers, the classes, and uh, just seeing other kids with ambitions. Our civic leaders, like Cheryl Burton, a news anchor, which graduated from Limbalone in 1980, created a journalistic college scholarship for the students graduating in 2021, and still goes on to this day. Our one common goal is to always be the generation of excellence. I would go to a funeral for one of our classmates and the gathering and the support that we had for those funerals was amazing. And I got tired of us getting together only when one of us dies or we have to wait 10 years for a reunion because we had the most amazing uh, reunions, the most amazing get togethers. And so I started throwing parties for absolutely no reason once a month, every third Saturday of the month, getting together for no reason, just to commiserate, just to kick it, because we all remained tight from high school and never had reasons to get together other when somebody died. And what became of that is still developing. Everything that's happening now is developing because it's so easy for us to get together with these types of, of picnics of thousands of us, Nest Fest and, and community outreach and the things that we're doing. I grew up on uh, 91st, right off of Stony Island, um, right, right near Pill Hill area. But uh, coming from that area and going over to Inglewood, it was a challenge every day, but I, I knew that I wanted to do it. Um, there was uh, you know, always you know, some, some, some different types of things you had to go through. <laughs> I remember specifically, I was the uh, basketball coach, uh, uh, one of the basketball managers at Limbalo, and the basketball team had just lost a game. We were at home, and the coach was yelling at them, and I'm saying to myself, I'm packing things. I'm like, I really don't need to listen to all this. So I leave out. I leave out early, catch the bus, and I get down to, to 63rd and, and State, and it was like a group of guys from coming from Inglewood High School. Had this nice leather jacket on. They wanted that leather jacket so bad, but uh, <laughs> they got it. 
The 80s were fitness obsessed with leggings, with oversized sweaters and jackets that were all the rage. The clothes were bold and mixed trends that in the past had categories. Many of us took the designer and matched them with things from the thrift store or designed and made our own clothing. The idea from the era set many trends. The word influencer was made for Generation Xers. One of the coolest things about back in the day, I don't know how the kids do it now, but the first day of school, you had to be super sharp. And I was extra sharp. I mean, the only problem was I only had one week's worth of new outfits. So after that first week of school, you had to mix and match that shirt with the pants from that day, with his pants from the shirt from that day. And so people would find out you only had a week worth of clothes. But it was a simpler time. It wasn't about name brand or anything like that. You had your own flair, your own style, and it was just great. Traditions social events, athletics, extracurricular activities, and influencers. Our alumni knew early on that if we were going to live up to our responsibilities as students, that it was important to always build a bridge for the next generation. So there would be a path for new leaders. The alumni had always acted as mentors and guided in support of traditions, programs, social groups, athletic programs, and funding for extracurricular activities. Students that graduated returned to the school to bring back things that they thought would prepare us for the collegiate experience. So I'm very thankful about the time that I grew up because it molded me into who I am today. It molded in the influences and all the things. Um, being a part of that generation that went from you know, bricks and mortar to technology to now uh, the cloud. Um, having all of those references allows me to think differently um, and have more exposure to so many different things that um, it really is, you know, beneficial to how I operate in business, how I operate in life, how I see things, how I operate with colleagues and loved ones, but most importantly, how I am able to continue to work with the population and, and the masses. And so um, it allows me to develop new things, uh, be creative outside of my own space, um, to establish relationships, to grow, and it doesn't limit me. And so what I would encourage the next generation to do is, you know, leave that open availability of creativity because that is what my generation experienced. And I think your generation can experience even more because you have the best of all the history has given you. And so use that to advance yourself for it. Limbloom in the 80s was a fantastic era. And we want the kids today to have the same experience, only graded with more technology and more availability and accessibility. And that's what the Gen X project is about. It's about giving back. It's about giving deserving students opportunities to go further in life in the, the fields that they choose and the fields that we are supporting them for. Danny Williams, Class 82, Limbloom Technical High School, swoop, swoop. <laughs> I can't turn it. You just now doing it. I know sign language. I'm sitting up here because I was pouring coffee. I didn't want y'all to think I was peeing. I couldn't hear you at all. Right. All that. I was. Let me start over. I'm just going to say what I loved about that was. It was amazing to me. It's the second time I've watched it and I watched it the whole way through the first time and I didn't intend to. But here's what it was. Even though I wasn't connected to the school in any way, even though I wasn't connected to any of the people. Uh, with their, their testimonials in any way, I still felt a part of the spirit of what it was all about. It took me back. It it gave me something to look forward to. Did a lot of things. So um, great job um, with that. The choice of people. Well, first thing I want to know, that, uh, I think Dottie Mosquito. <laughs> well, let me say this. You know, this is a group of individuals that were now going into a, 
you know, a, a, a school, right? Like you said, indoctrination after grammar school, having to test them, which is not something you would normally do for a public school after the civil rights movement. So you have to think about also the time in which these adolescents are going to this institution, right, of, of higher learning, right? And so people, you know, they don't understand that, particularly when you talk to people who are from, you know, uh, different races or, you know, different kind of dichotomies where they go, you know, I went to the school down the street from my house, right? Or, you know, this was what was in the district. So that's where I went to school and my brother went there and my cousins went there. They didn't do that when they have these selective enrollment schools. They go out, they put it out there to the elementary school students, and then they kind of like take the cream of the crop and put them into one place, right? So right there, that's a different kind of like change in mind, right? Of like, oh, this is going to be a whole new kind of situation, as Darnell said. But what made it special for us, um, understanding, you know, our background from our parents and the influence from our parents, as we said, our church, our communities, were people like Donnie, who, as we call him, Mosquito. He's got a story about that, but he's kind of like the mayor. He's been there since 77, and wow. he's been the glue, right, and the mortar, of that building to make sure that everyone was up to date on everything that was going on. He was always there the first day of school. I don't know if you know, you're talking about the safety in schools where they have, you know, safe zones. You know, he created a safe zone before there were safe zones, right? Mm. Where he would show up every day. Uh, I'm sorry, every, every first day of school and shake all the students hand and, you know, give them high fives and, welcome them, but also going to the basketball games, going to the baseball games, going to the parties. And as he said, you know, then taking it out to the alumni, making sure that people were there for weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, you know, uh, PhD graduations, having parties. Um, we had the Nest Fest, which was thousands and thousands and thousands of alumni and people from the community. The city of Chicago was amazing for our centennial, which was in 2019 before the pandemic, in which the entire city and industry came out and said, you know what, you have been a pillar of the um, community for so long black, white, purple, blue throughout the years of such a diverse school, even though it's predominantly black now, um, we wanted to make sure that everyone knew. And at that time also, it was right after Mayo Daly, before he left, um, made the school itself a national landmark. So it's a historical landmark mm -hmm. uh, within Chicago, which a lot of people don't, uh, uh, don't know. It's a beautiful Gothic style building. It's huge, you know, and um, people like Donnie, who's walked at halls, it, it was a different experience. And I think a lot of people understand because of the, the way that it, it was put together. The school right. was intentionally put together. The fact that it sits in a low income community, but on top of that, the fact that, you know, it's a, it's really everybody's story, right? It's an America kind of story. It just happens to be with, you know, people who are from African-American descent or, my, you know, or, or mixed race descent. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I want to ask about that neighborhood. So now that school's been there all this time, mm -hmm. and you said it's in a low-income area, but I would imagine it brings a lot of pride to the people that have grown up looking at that school, walking past it, watching kids come from all different areas of the city. And at first, maybe with a suspicious eye, who do they think they are coming over <laughs> here? Um, this and the other. But talk about that. Um, what about kids that came to the school that lived right around the corner? I imagine right. there had to be a few. Um, you know, what what was the difference? In well, everybody, experience. anybody can apply to go to Limbo, right? right? It's a selective enrollment. Not everybody's going to get in. We Not know that a lot in. of people were like, I wish I went to Limbo. You guys right. are amazing, you know, had the amazing experience that I didn't have. They wind up going to other schools or they wind up going to Inglewood High School, which is always right. and has always been our rival. It's literally like Bears Packers. <laughs> but I would imagine, did you not know some people that actually yeah. lived right there? Totally, totally. We had lots okay. of people. So my question is, in the documentary, because I didn't see this part, but I, I'm going to get it from you because I know you know somebody. You know, the people, who they all talked about coming from other areas. 
getting up at five o'clock and leaving and getting to school in time for the for the courses, which was another thing that stood out. The first girl, the educator, I believe she must teach at the school. She was actually our assistant principal for the last 27 years. OK, I, it yeah. didn't miss me that she didn't say get to school in time for my classes. She said, get to school in time from, for the courses. Now, courses, it's usually when kids start calling them that is when they get to college. But she was referring to what I felt now the same way she referred to it when she was that student. And I was like, wow, they, that's part of that grooming. They have them already living some of the things that to, they, they will expect when they get to well, college. The college preparatory schooling always had been. I know. And so from the time but, you walk in the door, it's like, okay, are you going to Harvard? Are you going to an HBCU? Are you going to Berkeley? Right. Are you going but, to, you know. But my point is that that breakdown, that nesting effect, a lot of people don't understand that, but it's those basic things that yeah. that's what made Motown, Hitsville, Motown because everything was inside to groom a person from the Ruta to the Tuta. And so- Absolutely. And I can tell you that it wasn't just the academic uh, portion of it. There was a lot of camaraderie when it came to all of the different uh, social groups. When you go into the exhibit, you're going to notice like, you know what? They had a lot of social groups. And it's not just like the, you know, the ones for like medicine or pom-pom or cheerleading or basketball or baseball. It's also social groups that they brought back that actually wind up being like baby fraternities and sororities that was at Limblom. Right. So that was really interesting because you had a lot of people that were like, what is like the family and what is Crunch Bunch and what is G5? And, you know, what what are these little groups like elite? We don't understand what that is. And it was a group of students that got together that were being groomed by fraternities that were Q's and Kappa's or Zeta's or AKA's or Delta's that came back to let them know this is also part of the collegiate experience when you go to college is being part of a particular social group that goes out not only to support you, but it's also to go back and support the community. So you have networking capabilities and, you know, you have all of these things that, you know, can build out companies and organizations. Yeah. And that was something that was particularly part of the African-American experience when we were building churches, when we were building Black Wall Street, when we were building these, you know, universities and historical HBCUs, it was built on those social groups that started within the church outwardly to build out our businesses and things that, you know, right. were in our community because we weren't getting the same opportunities that everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. We couldn't be a standard oil company. We couldn't go out and do those things. So when you say about, you know, coming in, I don't like the word indoctrination because we've always been taught to be individuals, but coming in and giving a really good understanding of what was out there in the world globally was something that we started, you know, way back, even though now they think about globalization, Generation X throughout the entire country being the smallest demographic of only 65 million people compared to the boomers and the millennials, we are really the ones that benefited the most from technology in a time in which we were basically the guinea pigs. We had the first computers. We were, you know, doing some of the first things that are now have, you know, grown into what we're doing right now, just like, you know, Andre talked about on the cloud. Well, we were coding back in school. We were using and that, computers. And one of the, let me, and that's because I don't want to forget this and I don't have it on my notes. So I'm just throwing it on out there. I would, I know that when you're doing um, filming and documentaries and things like that, you have, you start with a ton of content and you have to pick and choose what you're going to use because you can't, there's no, there's not room for every story. Mm -hmm. But in your gathering of, of these different stories, did you come across um, some parents uh, who are alumni whose children now go there. And what is the experience? What have you heard from second and third generations of people that, you know, graduated grandmama, grandpapa went there, daddy went there, mama went there, now I go there. Well, she Actually, goes one there. of the people who are on there, Andre Callum, his children went there. Um, David Blackman, who's another one of our alumni, I know personally his children went there and graduated. But, I know but My question is, did you guys talk? Did you get the story from both sides anywhere in there and it just didn't make it in to the documentary or is that still to come? Um, actually, that's in the actual, that's actually stories that we took and we put them in the museum experience because we have brothers and sisters. We have teachers 
who taught there, particularly I can think of Miss Brown, I can think of Miss Mr. Powers, that their children actually went to school when we were all there. So you have teachers, you have grandmas, grandpas, uh, whole generations of from um, and also uh, there's a story that's on the on the um, I'm sorry, the Generation X uh, website, but also on the Generation X uh, studio uh, programming on uh, Instagram and also the Generation X project on Facebook has a story of a brother and a sister that talk about uh, being there and, and the different generations from their grandmother uh, also attending and, you know, them, of course, going to sister first and then himself. So, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because, yes, just like other uh, universities, there's right. there's high schools, obviously, in other schools where there's generations of people. Generational history. Right. And it's rich it's history. From there. And that's, that's the point I wanted to hit before yeah. we get on here today is that's what I thought was so unique uh, because a lot of people go off to college and that's where they get that you know, that they return to and that they have those those bonds for a lifetime with mm -hmm. their college, sorority, fraternity, sisters and brothers, so on and so forth. But very rare in my experience. Um, have you found that in a high school in particular, um, an inner city high school where it's like, you know, a dandelion <sighs> once we graduate. I mean, I talk about it all the time. How many, if we only knew that day out on the football field when we were all signing each other's um, yearbooks, how many of us were lying when we said, see you next summer. Can't wait to right. da, 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 as if we were going and then never saw each other ever again, you yeah. know? And, and a lot of in the way I was graduated in 1980, I've not been to a, a reunion yet. And I was going to go oh. to the one that would have landed during COVID right there yeah. on COVID 20 because we graduated 80, but it was canceled. Sounds like yeah. figures, you know, because here's why I didn't return because I felt like I hadn't done enough yet. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I ain't going back. I, well, I ain't got nothing to report yet. Then all of a sudden I'm itching to go and talk about that. So, you know, I don't think people come back or stay there um, in what we, you, you've put inside this wonderful capsule known as history for us to, to dip our fingers and spirits inside of. I don't think it's just because of uh, what people would think. I think it's a lot deeper. It's that collectiveness, that familyness. So um, exactly. really interesting. I What are your hopes for people that visit the museum and really get well, immersed it's in this so experience. much bigger than this the exposition i don't want people to think like it's just this one part this is the part that's kind of about like school and you know the collegiate experience in that particular gallery but as a curator i'm supporting the other curators and supporting the other programs in particular uh erica hoist i have to thank a couple people who um is the museum history curator for the entire expedition that's there you really walk into a time capsule it is absolutely amazing i don't want to give anything away the history the fashion the technology is interactive um you know just you walk in and you're like oh my god this is literally a time in life that you see the beginning of things but at the same time there's a lot of things you're like i had no idea that that was the first iteration of you know this particular technology or that you know this is why these things came into play in our laws our history uh t television shows film um you know politics uh you know things that have happened you know people don't think about like you say this trajectory of how things happen and you're able to walk in and immerse yourself in all of these things and um pick things up and use it and play the old video games. And uh, they have a whole recreation of a home from back then, which a lot of us will remember being latchkey kids. Yes. See, and, oh, yeah. Sega, yeah, and, and all of the toys too. and then going through all of the fashion and how fabulous it was. Sexy sixties to like, oh, yeah. 80. So well, I saw the TLC outfit up in there. Right, exactly. Yes, yes, but then, yes, you know, yes. just going in and seeing like all of the ways in which we use to communicate and live and learn and work within, you know, this this great big world and connect. And people forget about all of the things that have happened between 1965 to 1980 that are some of the things we're dealing with right now, which is school shootings, which is the economy, dealing with, you know, oil prices, dealing with egg prices. Um, when you're like going through your reading. So also, you know, mm. 
all of the stars and just everybody that they're talking about through, you know, history and everything that happened. But it's a great exhibit. It's a huge expedition. And I invite everyone to come down. And I also want to thank Pathfinder, who is actually the videography team, um, as well as K-Shack Video, who was responsible. And also um, Ava Novak and the team from um, New York University, who were the, uh, the, these are all of the millennials that we gave jobs to that came in and worked on the actual film and the footage and shooting awesome. and putting together the treatments and things like that. And a lot of times people forget that we actually hired the millennials because we wanted to be multi-generational, Generation how, how, X. How long will the, um, will it be available for people to visit and part, take a part of you know, That's the great part about it is that we made, even though we uh, have it as an expedition, we made portions of it mobile. So it opened up, as I said, the end of January, it goes to the first week of September. And okay. at that point, we'll be spending time that's our raising funds to pack it all up and we'll be bringing it back to Chicago to tour. So uh, okay. we're hoping that people will have their opportunity to actually share their stories, to share their family stories, no matter where they come from. And then with the curriculum um, portion that's attached to it, um, there's a whole curriculum that's going to go with it. Okay. Um, they're going to be adopting it at other schools and other not-for-profits to help them raise money for their students. That's awesome. Well, unfortunately, the power we will be in Romania this year <laughs> instead of in Chicago, but every other year it is back in Chicago. So um, hopefully we can get your mobile to come to the power we at the Stan Mansion next year for 2024 and share this wonderful. We'd wonderful love that. Thank you for the invitation. We plan on yep. doing quite a few pop-ups and yep. giving people an opportunity to get their stories on not just the Gen mm -hmm. X project, but also to have people come on and interview on the Gen X studio. Awesome. Well, thank you. You guys listen on your screen right now. And also we'll, we'll take the liberty of dropping it in your comment section are the two roads that lead to more information about this wonderful exposition. So get out there and take a look. Alicia Novak's, uh, Robert Novak, thank you so much for showing up and thank showing you, out. Lauren. Yes, wow. you're welcome anytime. And um, great work, really a great job. I wouldn't be surprised you get some awards for it. If Aww. not, you certainly deserve them. So thank you so much. Um, it's all in the spirit of divine memories. You know, don't just create fond memories. That's a party that faded when the hangover left. Create divine memories, those ones that will be looking back at you as you look toward what comes next when we leave this world. That's it for today. I want to thank you all for being a blessing and for blessing me. Come back tomorrow, God willing, 8 a.m. Central. I'll meet you. You guessed it right out front on the front porch. So together we can fulfill that greatest promise where two or more comes together. I'll see you. I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Alicia. Great Bye. job. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Show.